Hi, I'm Matthias, and this is the Pistol 1904, a German naval Luger, which some collectors actually like to call the 1906, but we'll clarify that in just a moment after we get done with the light box. Weight-wise, we're close to our previous model 1900, just over two pounds now, and we still have an eight round detachable box magazine. However, it's now chambering the nine millimeter Parabellum cartridge. The overall length, however, 11 inches, which is without the detachable stock. That makes this both pistol and potential pistol caliber carbine, which is why it's also been fitted with a two position rear sight. Thanks to the support of our patrons, C and Arsenal has managed to grow strong enough that we can provide a much better history lesson than we could in the beginning. Whenever possible, I've been going back and cleaning up our earlier episodes, and while today we have a pistol that our show has not actually covered before, it's going to give us the opportunity to lay a much better framework for the understanding of the German adoption of the Luger as a whole. So consider this episode the gap between the Swiss 1900 and the eventual world-renowned German P08. Now, last episode, we covered the development of the Borchardt C93. Hugo's invention had opened a lot of eyes to the promise of an effective semi-automatic pistol, one that was powerful enough for martial considerations, but ultimately it suffered from too many minor issues, mostly around the massive weight and severe complexity. Since Borchardt was unwilling to radically alter his design, another man was brought in. Georg Luger, formerly of the Austrian army, an excellent marksman, terrific linguist, and a good engineer to boot. Parent company DWM believed Luger had what it took to make the Borchardt a competitive handgun. This was his contribution, what became the Swiss model of 1900, otherwise known as the old model Luger pistol. We'll explain more on why in a moment. Toggle locked, magazine fed, automatic and manual safeties, it was a dream to hold, pleasant to shoot, and still plenty lethal. While it of course managed adoption in Switzerland, Luger was going to have to work out some kinks before the much larger German army would accept his eventual masterpiece. Just a reminder, the fairly new German Empire had adopted an already obsolete single action only large bore black powder cavalry pistol back in 1879. In 1883, the same action was fitted into a more human hand sized frame. Still single action, mind you, and of course lacking even an ejector rod. While the old 1879 was eventually semi-retired, the model 1883 remained the go-to handgun for Germany, and by 1891, it was actually becoming something of an acute problem. Field artillery now needed a revolver in significant numbers, enough that the decision to produce more 1883s would result in a further commitment to the Reich's revolver's 10.6mm black powder cartridge. However, back in 1886, France had adopted the first smokeless powder rifle and revealed it in 1887, causing an international arms race. Everyone was going smokeless and small bore. So the German Gewehr Proofings Commission would begin considering an updated handgun, and here is where we hit a bit of a snag. Most of these endeavors were being led by Prussia, with reports being sent out to the various other states. However, the meticulous Prussian records have disappeared, <laughs> likely destroyed entirely by well, not one, but two world wars. Actually, probably mostly the second one did it. So most of what we know comes from Bavarian records, which usually amount to little one or two line briefs, uh, trials with X gun and Y date, or asked to produce in another cartridge. It's not a lot, but it gives us a framework from which we can make some safer assumptions. Looking around the military revolver market, the German commission would have found a variety of wheel guns that wouldn't seem very antiquated to our modern eyes. Almost all were both single and double action, and they had various safety features like automatic rebounds or abity loading gates. Some had rapid ejection systems and commercial quick loaders were starting to appear, but something wasn't right. Revolvers seemed to be poorly optimized for smokeless powder. So here's the deal, everyone is suddenly going small bore, high speed projectile. Well, I say suddenly, but certain countries were already on that track before, even with black powder. Looking at you, Switzerland. You and your jacketed bullets and compressed black powder. There was also this old habit of making your rifle and pistol have the same bore diameter. That way you could recycle uh, ruined barrels and otherwise uh, share manufacturing tooling. But the Germans likely found what a lot of us know today, an eight millimeter revolver with a mild enough recoil for rapid follow-up shooting makes for a fairly anemic cartridge. I'm looking at you, France, you know what you did. 
German officials were also not fools. The broad, broad majority of revolver designs feature a cylinder gap, a space between the cylinder and the barrel, and that's where a fair bit of energy is lost with each shot. There were attempts to address this issue with gas heel revolvers, but they tended to be unnecessarily complicated and suffer from awful trigger pulls. Also, they weren't really fleshed out at this point in time anyway. Smokeless powder didn't just increase muzzle velocity, right there in the name, smokeless. Well, that's because it was burning more completely, leaving just a tiny fraction of the usual fouling in the host firearm. This made it possible for more complicated, precisely fit mechanisms to operate for a much longer time, a much higher number of shots, before any requisite taking apart and cleaning. Hiro Maxim had already made machine guns work reliably, still in the black powder era, thanks to generous tolerances in large components. But now with Smokeless on hand, there was an option to miniaturize some of that fairly fancy mechanism work, and the German GPK would review at least one that we know of. Luis Schlegelmilk's manual operated repeating pistol. So not an autoloader, more of a trigger finger lever handgun or something. Ultimately, far too complicated and delicate for military service, though. And speaking of Schlegel Milk, uh, Francis LaBelle prompted the Germans to adopt the Gewehr 1888 rifle, uh, which we have covered before in detail. These had significant numbers of teething issues, and even by 1892, was, they were likely making the GPK more cautious about adopting new technology. Ultimately, the commission stalled out on the revolver issue. Honestly, it seems like they correctly realized that there were... So they were sort of sitting in this like technological lull, waiting for the next big thing. That something was coming. Following the Reich's revolver, they likely weren't eager to be instantly outdated, and following the Gewehr 1888, they didn't want something that was unproven. With no obvious decision in hand in 1893, they opted to just make more Reich's revolvers, specifically the model of 1883, those poor artillerymen. Now again, the GPK weren't fools, they wouldn't just sit on their hands and wait for a magical future pistol to be dropped into the lap. Instead, the government rifle factories at Erfurt and Spandau were ordered to each design and present their own idea for a revolver. Whatever Erfurt kicked up, we don't know, but it was rejected out of hand. There are, however, records of Spandau's offer, which I have not seen an actual physical example of, but we know from writing that it used an apparent Abadie gate, a Hornet rebound, and a Nagant-style barrel-swinging ejector rod. It was produced as a double action for officers and a single action for the enlisted men. Six of each mechanism were produced, and thanks to those missing Prussian records, we have no idea what happened after that. The guns are not reported on again in Bavaria, and of course, they never materialize. I don't even know of a single surviving example. Given that they were produced in 1896, however, I have a pretty solid theory about what happened. Paul Mauser and the Fieder Lee brothers happened, who introduced their new auto-loading pistol, albeit nascent, to the German army. It had a lot of advantages over any revolver. You can actually check out our episode on the C96 if you'd like to know more about the German trials and eventual sort of kind of maybe adoption of this classic handgun. For now, however, we're just going to skim right over that topic. Basically, in 1898, Germany officially begins testing auto-loading pistols. The C96 battles it out with the usual uh, cadre of competitors until the adoption of the Gewehr 98 rifle, the massive production of which consumes German arsenal's time and budgets for a number of years. Germany would also be an early adopter of machine guns, putting an emphasis on their training and use, and again that meant more money and more time. So the selection of a new pistol really slowed to a crawl. Uh, though, as they did progress, the Mauser C96 did remain the clear frontrunner. Unfortunately for Mauser, however, it never quite satisfied the GPK entirely. Eventually, as we know from our last episode, Georg Luger's improved Borchardt would come to their attention. Likely this was unofficial at first, but the matter was formalized with a note to Bavaria in September of 1900, which points out initial demonstrations with Monlickers and Borchardt Luger pistols, and includes that Trials pistols have been ordered, with the Luger pistol arriving in December of 1900. It's likely the GPK received a modified Swiss Trials model, as full production of the Swiss 1900 had not started. This was the same for Trials pistols sent to, say, Britain. By January of 1901, the Monlicker still hadn't arrived, and the C96 was deep into trials, 
and was going through considerations for like holster leather and things like that. The note from Prussia simply said that the Vorschart Luger will probably take part in the new field trials alongside the Mauser pistol. That's actually a pretty good up considering how deep the Mauser was in. Then in February, a seemingly radical change. The field trials were discontinued entirely and the improved pistols were to be simply tested. One line even says, the adoption of the self-loading pistol though is basically a settled matter, with the assumption being that the C96 was at that time the king of the hill and almost assuredly going to be adopted. But then in April, a crack. In reference to the Monlicker and Luger designs, the pistols will be submitted together with the altered Mauser pistol. That means they're requesting updates from Mauser's company. Something is going on that they like with another gun. By July of 1901, the Monlicker was abandoned. The C96 was being tested for mounted troops with the stock and the Borchardt Luger was receiving a favorable report. Really, the only major problem noted was its complexity compared to the C96, apparently 59 parts compared to the Mauser's 37. Over time, Luger would simplify the rebound latch, saving four parts. He ditched the hold open entirely, just for the GPK, mind you, saving three parts, and dropped the automatic safety, but did have to ultimately keep a manual one. In November, a new comparative field test of the improved Mauser pistol against the Borchardt Luger had been initiated. Curiously, the Monlicker reappears in December, although it's now it's uh, just being considered for approval for officer private purchases. We see this a lot with the Monlicker. So 15 of those guys and 55 Mausers and 55 Borchardt Lugers were ordered for trials in 1902. DWM provided two types of Luger pistol to this trial. Both were standard commercial old models with uh, a word, Gessigert, marked on the safety path. 15 were still sporting the automatic grip safety. These were meant for officers, but the balance of 40 had only a manual safety, which actually made for a slight redesign and became the precursor to what would become the Army's P08 pattern. The field trials began in July of 1902, and their length was fixed at 15 months. Gotta be thorough. One battalion of infantry, one cavalry regiment, and one MG det detachment, plus the Prussian Infantry School of Musketry. The results were to be turned in by December 1st of 1903, and all testing was to be reported back to the GPK, which would then evaluate the results. While the Luger was again seen as a superior design, there were of course some complaints. The biggest problem was a tendency to jam, almost always by the toggle not fully dropping back into battery and therefore keeping the gun from being able to fire the next round. There were some concerns around parts breaking, specifically the extractor, and the weight could still be improved. And like the Swiss before, the Germans were having a hard time knowing if their guns were loaded or not. I think they specifically requested a cocking indicator. The GPK also inquired about a manual hold open option. They felt the safe and fire positions were too close together and that the safety was too hard to operate one handed. We saw the Swiss dealing with that same issue in our last episode. Now while that's happening, Luger is also attempting to sell his pistol to various countries around the world and a fair few are nibbling at the hook. Although he's having again some difficulty getting conservative militaries to accept his you know, small bore high velocity cartridge. Don't forget from last time, he's using a roughly 30 caliber bullet in an era where most of the smaller revolvers are still at least 38s. Yes, the math works out on paper, but could 765 be a man stopper in wartime? The question actually came up for a number of European nations, but there were two big markets that were outright contemptuous of small bore handguns, the British and the Americans. Both of their armies were still using revolvers. The Webley Mark IV with its big 455 bullet in England and the Colt New Army with its 38 caliber, fairly mild cartridge and swing out cylinder. Now that latter gun especially should give the small bore Luger some hope. Unfortunately, the US Ordnance Department wasn't happy with the 38 and was already reissuing 45 caliber single action Colt 1873s in some cases, specifically in the Philippines where they were also purchasing Colt 1902 double actions again in 45. Both nations were either recently or presently involved in a number of colonial campaigns in which officers might suddenly find themselves being charged, outnumbered by spear or sword wielding native populations. The fear of this situation and stories involved in it say that you would find a spearman slumped dead over top of an officer who had been completely impaled having discharged his revolver. So the focus became 
having a handgun that with one or two rounds could deliver a stopping blow, a critically, mortally, immediately wounding blow. DWM sales agent in Britain was Vickers Limited, who arranged a demonstration back in April of 1900. The mechanism impressed the small arms committee, but the bullet obviously did not. They wanted to know if the gun could be made in a 45 caliber. Subsequent testing of six examples confirmed that they were not authoritative enough in that 765 Parabellum cartridge. The US of A also took an early interest and naval officers were wooed with records of clay block tests that compared the 44 Russian cartridge to the 765 Parabellum. Certainly seems to be an improvement, maybe velocity could make the difference. In March of 1901, the Army Board of Ordnance at Springfield Armory would be shown the 765 Luger pistol in person. Our friend from last episode, Hans Tosher, would be the demonstrator. Fun fact about Hans, by the way, during World War I, he was accused of plotting sabotage against the Canadian Welland Canal, though he was acquitted by trial. One of his accused co-conspirators, by the way, was Franz von Rintelen, who absolutely was a spy and saboteur in World War I. We actually got to know him from our Madsen episode, and I just thought you'd enjoy the weird connection. Anyway, Hans Tauscher demonstrated the Luger in March of 1901 to U.S. ordinance. This led to a further investigation of two pistols, which in turn led to 1,000 for U.S. cavalry trials in October of 1901. These were still in 7.65mm and resulted in a lot of mixed opinions. The pistols were light, balanced, easy to use. But the most glaring issue was doubts over how effective such a small bullet would be, no matter how fast it was going. Obviously, Luger was going to need a bigger bullet, and so he did the most sensible thing he could do in an attempt to keep as many parts constant as possible. He took that 765 bottleneck cartridge and blew it out into a straight-walled 9mm. With a few tweaks, this would evolve into the 9mm Parabellum cartridge. Its early finalized martial form had a specific truncated cone shape. This was done in order to further help apply mechanical advantage to the target, while preserving some aerodynamic advantages and easier feeding. A letter from Vickers Limited to the British Small Arms Committee seems to mark the first sure instance of 9mm Parabellum being mentioned in March of 1902. Unfortunately for Luger, 9mm is still smaller than 40 caliber, and so the cartridge was summarily ignored. The British wouldn't see anything under 40, and of course they'd go up from there. However, the U.S. was more receptive, and Georg Luger himself would present the 9mm version in May of 1903, the first military trial of the new cartridge. Following the demonstration, DWM offered to swap out 50 of the cavalry trials pistols for 50 new 9mm pistols for the U.S. to play with. Ordnance agreed, provided that they were fitted with the Powell cartridge indicator, a clear path milled in the grip which told the user how many rounds remained in the magazine. These arrived in April of 1904 after some manufacturing delays. While we are here, this pistol also reveals another change to the Luger, the shortened frame. Now I do not have an amazingly rare US Trials pistol here. Well, not a Luger US Trials pistol anyway, but I do have this much later, well, new model Luger, and we're going to ignore a lot of its features, but I do want to show you one thing for just a moment. For comparison, we have our old model Swiss, and we have what is the quote-unquote new model, and in this case new frame, Portuguese naval Luger. Now, thank you John for learning this by the way. Let's take a look at, well, actually something that's very hard to see. If you really squint, you notice that this distance here, this height of metal that I'm poking at, is slightly higher than this, maybe a sixteenth of an inch, not quite an eighth, all right? And if you were to really get out the calipers, you're gonna find very minor differences in many directions between this old frame and this new one. But if you'd like to be able to eyeball one at a glance, the easiest place to see the trim down is actually right around the takedown lever. In this case, on the 1900, we have this nice slow curve, right? Nice and wide, sticks out way away from the takedown lever, comes in, doubles back for our trigger guard. Beautiful looking, but very stout, all right? Like, just look at all the real estate, all the uh, blued metal around that straw, right? Now in this case, check it out, nice and tight. It actually mirrors the shape of the takedown lever. Straight, then curve, then straight where as this, nice and round. 
that's the easiest way to spot an old versus new frame. All right, back to our story. The US is trying the 9mm cartridge. Unfortunately, being the first of their kind, these pistols suffered ammunition problems. Misfires and jams were common, and both cavalry and field artillery reported negatively on the new gun. Making matters worse, 1904 was the year of the Thompson Lagarde test. Then Colonel John T. Thompson and Major Louis Lagarde were tasked with solving the caliber question, and in doing so put a variety of cartridges to work, while noting the effects of bullet diameter, bullet weight, velocity, and bullet shape. Also at one point they shot a horse with an exploding bullet, which might be the best summary as to how gruesome this testing became, largely carried out at the Chicago Union Stockyards they would basically shoot cattle in various ways with various numbers of bullets and time how long it took for them to expire. I'll save you all the details and just say that the large bore revolver cartridges tended to kill in under five shots, whereas the small bore revolver and pistol cartridges took more rounds and a longer period of time. So the US was going to stick with 45 caliber. We'll see this have an effect on the Colt Trials pistols in another episode, by the way. Also, fun fact, cupped bullets, basically hollow points, were very effective, but were also banned by the Hague Convention already. Eventually, DWM and Luger would try for a 45 caliber pistol which required a massive overhaul and ultimately failed to be adopted anyway. This is a story for another day. However, their efforts in 9mm did interest the German Gewehr Proofings Commission. They were also concerned with the lethality of the small bore 765 Parabellum cartridge, which wasn't even as hot as the C96's 763 that they were already trying. Trials notes from March of 1904 point out that Luger had provided a model with improved mortality thanks to a larger bullet and unique bullet shape. Luger also attempted to address as many of the previous concerns that the GPK trials had as humanly possible. From the outside, we can see his new loaded chamber indicator, which is actually part of an improved extractor as well. When a cartridge is chambered, the new component tips upwards, revealing text embossed on its side, literally telling the user that it's loaded. As we mentioned earlier, the rebound check lever would be simplified, but this actually proved to be unnecessary in the long run. Also, the gripping surface for the toggles has been changed. They are now flat-headed with checkering all over, instead of the scallops we saw before. Now, around this time, Germany was still conducting most of their testing with the 7.65mm chambered pistols while separately investigating the 9mm cartridge, and it seems Luger had already solved the problem with the toggle failing to return to battery, but it does appear that he was keeping it under wraps for as long as possible, likely in order to limit the idea of being stolen while still getting to patent it at the last possible minute. So, the solution to all of this in Luger's eyes? Well, it was to replace the paired flat mainsprings with a single powerful coil spring. This neatly sewed up the issue and made for a much better functioning firearm. And with that, we have the last of the features that let us break up Luger's into what you'd call the old model, and the new model. Generally, the Swiss 1900 and German P08 are the quintessential definitions of these categories. The new model has the following changes baked in. The double leaf springs have been replaced with a coil spring. The extractor now serves as a chamber indicator and has been reinforced. The previously scalloped hinged knuckles are now flattened and checkered. And thanks to the powerful coil spring, we no longer need that rebound preventing latch on the side of the toggle. To save weight, the receiver was slightly reduced inside. You can most easily see this by the curvature in front of the takedown lever. Old is rounder, new is more squared up. New models can generally be found in 9mm or 7.65 Parabellum. The production old models generally were only in 7.65. There are, of course, exceptions for trials in small lots of odd batches. Also note, while many countries opted out of the grip safety, it remained an option on the new model pistols. Now again, thanks to trials in France and other nations, uh, plus some carbines that we'll actually talk about in a moment, there are a whole host of transitional Lugers in this sort of period of time. Old frame, new frame, slightly longer, slightly shorter breech blocks, mixtures of calibers and toggle profiles. You get the idea. Also at this point, Germany is likely still working mostly with 7.65mm pistols for trials, but the GPK is still investigating the 9mm cartridge as a separate issue, like we said earlier. 
I am not going to be breaking all of that down into minutia. Uh, if you want that, I recommend the massive three volume set from Gortz and Sturgis for that sort of detail. Now, steering back towards German testing, I just want to hit on some quick notes. The 9mm Luger saw further testing in May of 1904, and in June, uh, Fromer actually submitted an 8mm pistol, which was well received, but prompted a request. Can you make that in 9mm? Yeah, that cartridge is starting to sink in. And from here, the trials sort of unwound slowly and without significant impact on the Luger, and yet, there was no immediate victory. Instead, Mauser would introduce his own 9mm export cartridge and eventually a whole new pistol, which in time evolved into the CO608. This competition and more likely repeated priority budget items stalled the German army adoption of the Luger all the way until 1908, which is something that we kind of covered in our PO8 episode. And despite all of my walk up so far, this episode is about a slightly different gun, one that was adopted at the time that you would have thought the army trials should have been over, decisively over, 1904. So what exactly happened? Well, the German army was actually the culmination of regional armies, Prussia, Bavaria, Saxony, and Württemberg. We've seen these states in their individual arms contracts in many of our episodes. Making a decision on a standard issue arm therefore meant affecting a number of subsidiary departments and required careful planning and interlocking budgets. The German Navy, however, that was a more unified force. The uh, Kaiserlich Marine wasn't subordinate to, say, the Prussian Ministry of War. It was a standalone imperial branch like the Schutztruppe in Africa. And the Navy also needed small arms, specifically pistols, for boarding parties who would need to search vessels, or to have an armed prize crew who could see a captured ship and sail it back into friendly port or really any other form of guard duty. The German Navy also had a fairly unique view on Marines. They had a small force known as the Sea Battalion, which served somewhat like the British Royal Marine Light Infantry. These were not usually redundant men, rather someone may be a sailor one day and serve as an impromptu infantry the next. So a ship of the line may have close to 250 rifles and 90 pistols close to home, or when deployed further out, this could rise to as many as 400 rifles and 110 pistols. And by 1904, while the army was testing its new auto-loading pistol options, what was the German Navy actually using? Yep, the Reich's revolver. Not great. That means that the Navy was watching the army trials with interest. And during 1904, when the matter of which was the best handgun was clearly described, well, they were kind of on it. However, the army didn't bite and had to move paper around and had to hash out their budget. The Navy was more flexible and had more funding, but they weren't as sensitive as the army to the issue of weight. And they were hoping to get some extra features for those extra grams. We saw the same thinking in our Italian Modello 1899 episode. Naval troops aren't expected to be marching for days on end, so a heavier handgun that could maybe double as a carbine gives your usually outnumbered Marines a little extra firepower. The only problem is, as far as the German army was concerned, the C96 was a handgun. They really weren't considering the stock options at this point. However, from the first trials in Switzerland, Georg Luger had been offering the option of a stock attachment for a long-barreled Marshall pistol. Like with so many other stock pistols, however, this seems to have been a suggestion from the manufacturer's side and not a request from the military. Instead, the first known instance of someone actually wanting a stocked Luger seems to have come from South America, specifically Chile and its army commander. Emil Korner, former officer of the Prussian army, he had been hired after the War of the Pacific and ultimately turned on the Chilean government due to political stagnation. Korner was instrumental in leading troops during the Chilean Civil War of 1891, which netted him respect in the new government. From here, he would further encourage German-style martial reforms inside the Chilean army, eventually rising to the top. Supposedly, Korner specifically requested a stocked carbine version of the Luger pistol, long-barreled and sighted for up to 600 meters. This was during his trip back to Germany in 1900 while looking for arms to purchase. It's more likely, however, that Luger was working on the possibility and just plain showed it to Corner. Period Chilean military journals do report on experiments and pending adoption of a Luger carbine. However, only some small trials models were ever developed, long-barreled, using a push-button detachable stock. 
They also had a multi-position rear sight mounted on the rear toggle arm, which we'll see carry forward. At this time, it's three positions. Thanks to competition with the stock C96, there would be a number of experimental Luger carbines differing in barrel lengths and rear sights. We'll eventually see a commercial pattern of carbine, but this was clearly not a military pistol anymore anyway. Now as for the Marshall side of the stock pistols, the general pattern remained the same with minor improvements being made. So you'd see the push button become a lever, uh, fixed rear sights were tried for a while. It's likely that as early as 1902, DWM was offering the German Navy a, you know, uh, 600 meter, 175 millimeter barreled stocked pistol. This would by 1904 be negotiated into a simplified pattern a 150 millimeter barrel, lever attached stock, and two position rear sight, 100 and 200 meters. The Navy would order roughly 150 of these pistols for a very specific sort of trial. You see, following the German Army's assessment of the plain Luger pistol, the Navy felt confident adopting their own semi-carbine version, so much so that the only purpose to these trials is to establish how they would be carried, which is a big consideration for something like a Navy. They have to have holsters and cartridge pouches, but they also have to have very specific racks aboard the ship for the pistols and the ammunition that have to be locked down and safe. Plus, they had to develop a safety doctrine for how to handle the guns. Now, this is where it gets a little bit weird. Luger's juggling a lot of trials and making a lot of changes to his pistols during the same year. Repeatedly, we see him borrow guns from trials in one country and then modify them and send them over to that country, all right? Basically, he was short on parts and the development of the new model small frame, eh, it would have taken him a lot of precious time and material to produce 150 or so with the stock logs and all the extras that he already had some frames laying around for. So if we look again, this is an old model frame, slightly larger and heavier. And if we could see inside, we'd find an old model flat mainspring, which is why the otherwise updated toggle grips still have that rebound check lever, albeit simplified. And while we're here, the grip safety and manual safety and, oh, concentric circle magazine base, neat. The carry trials began in August of 1904 and were to be reported on by the end of September of that same year. Curiously, these make-do trials pistols did see service in the Maji Maji Rebellion, the Herrera Wars, and the subsequent Hottentot Uprising. Expeditionary forces sent to assist the local Schutztruppe were issued 19 of the Navy trials pistols, with 18 returning. Apparently, the notes were that they were unwieldy and the officers preferred pocket pistols like the Browning. Huh. This report either didn't phase the Navy's decision makers or more likely they got it too late because in May of 1905, what remnants of data we have reveal a note to the Baltic Naval Station in Kiel uh, saying that the design of the self-loading pistol tested in 1904 is to now be considered as finalized. Since Luger had to rush, it had been okay to leave out minor details as the trial pistol was not expected to be the final design. However, by selecting the larger frame and then providing it to the Navy at a time when they would be, oh, I don't know, designing all their leather and wood for holding the things, he sort of married them to the exterior dimensions, if not the interior components. You know, he could add in the new coil spring and ditch the check lever, but he couldn't change the, the shape of the large frame now. Curiously, there is no sign of an official Supreme Order in Council on the matter of adoption, but this was designated the self pistol 1904, which was later simplified to pistol 1904. And we can finally get a closer look. Thanks to our Discord moderator, GBF, we have a pistol 1904 to work with. It's not the prettiest one I've ever seen, but you know what? He loaned it, it's here, and it runs. So this is the best one that I know of. Now, in this case, uh, do ignore whatever this scratched monogram is. Somebody must have been proud to own it at one point. And let's take in its general features. Coming from the old Swiss, we're not surprised to see, I don't know, these grip panels, this grip angle. We're not surprised to see the magazine release there. We're not surprised to see uh, the magazine base here. Although I will say this is not the correct magazine for this pistol. Uh, if I remove that actually, you'll see this one's a bit dark and it has a wood base. These are supposed to be in the white with concentric circles in the wood plug. This has been replaced sometime over the years. Now, unlike the Swiss, this is of course a nine millimeter parabellum. It has the updated 
uh, checkering on the side here. And because of the change in the lock, we can now open this by simply pushing up over center. It no longer has the rebound check lever here. That was just in the prototype pistols. All right, so uh, let's see what we can get into. We still have a large frame. You can see all that extra material around the takedown, although it's still not quite as thick as the Swiss if I really look at it. We have a long barrel and a little reinforcement at the front, likely along the lines of protecting that muzzle and making sure we're not taking a lot of damage with this hanging out in the wind at the bottom of the holster. Looking up top, we have a two position rear sight, clearly marked for 100 meters, or if I press this neat little button and pull backwards, 200 meters, it was hidden there the entire time. Just to show that from the other side, in and out to 200 meters. And it still allows the toggle to work just like it should. An almost guarantee on these pistols is some sort of marking here underneath the automatic grip safety. In this case, mine says WD. The most common marks are WK for Weft Kiel, that's in the Baltic Sea, WW for Weft Wilhelmshaven, that's in the North Sea, and WD for Weft Danzig, also in the Baltic. All of these are, of course, dockyards from whence the pistols would be issued to ships. You might also find unique specific marks like this for the torpedo division or various fortifications and more. Returning to that grip safety, it's just like the one on the 1900, although in this case, we've relocated our locking stud up here so that when I flip down, we are on safe. And you can even see that there's a marking here that says essentially safe. Here's the issue. This is not how the gun was manufactured. You see, on the original 1904, flipping the safety up meant the gun was on safe and would reveal text underneath the lever. However, when the German army adopted the PO8, they opted to flip the safety position, so downwards became safe. In 1912, the Navy would officially standardize on the same by ordering existing pistols to have their safety positions swapped. Now, like I said before, the changeover is as simple as just taking a stud from here and putting it up there, in this case, replacing the whole part. However, uh, the frame originally would have been marked on safe here. This would have been the safe position the word safety would have been here. And if you look just closely enough, you might be able to make it out where it was ground out on this particular pistol. It originally was in this position and it was replaced and therefore flipped. You may notice coming from the 1900 that our bolt is rounder up top and we have these little ears to help protect our extractor and secure it better. And our extractor is pretty beefy, but it also does something else. I've loaded a single snap cap into this magazine, so so we'll just uh, rack her in there real quick and, and now we can see that the extractor has risen and it's exposed, ooh, Galadin. That's telling us that we're loaded. And if you can't see that minor difference, you can at least feel it. You can put a thumb right there on it and oh yeah, that guy's chambered. Mm, that's a nice little loaded chamber indicator. Now takedown is the same as the last model. So if I walk her back, flip the lever, and let her forward, we can remove the plate, which again has our uh, transfer bar. We can roll this guy off and ta -da, ta da we're in and clear. We can still take apart the bolt just as before, but nothing fancy is happening there. However, I do want to show you something inside this left grip panel. Ah oh, yeah, a beefy coil mainspring attached to an armature that then hooks on that same spur like we saw in the last model. This is much stronger, and it's why they no longer had to have that rebound check lever. With the gun reassembled, I can actually show you ooh, the stock. Now this is a reproduction, but it's pretty close to the original. Uh, we do not have the holster that would have been attached. Uh, that would go through here. It would have a nice piece of leather. The gun would then be able to go into the holster, and it would all be stored together on your hip. And then you could draw the gun from the holster, and after that, you could detach the leather from your belt, and then use this as a stock with the leather holster still attached. We can still show the method of attachment, though, because we have our lug at the back of the pistol. We slide on up, and then we rotate our lever into the locked position. There we go, when we're all the way home. Now the reason to switch over to the lever from the button, I believe, is so that you can get a little camming action. This fits a little loose, as you can tell, but it'll certainly do the job to allow us to run this like a little pistol carbine when May gets it over to the range a little bit later. 
All right, I think we can probably get a better view of those changes that make this the new model compared to the old with a little help from our animation. Loading up our magazine, the first difference between this and the old model is that 9mm Parabellum cartridge. Second, as we go to work the knee jointed bolt, we can now simply pull outward on the checkered pads. No need to cock rearward to unlock this time. This coil mainspring is the reason Luger was able to delete the rebound check lever. It yanks the bolt back into place without risk of bouncing back out of battery. Overall, the trigger and sear arrangement has not changed from the previous old model, including the disconnect. However, the safety is slightly changed. The direction has been reversed, which meant a minor modification, but the concept is still the same overall. The short recoil toggle locking bolt assembly is also largely unchanged in operation, though the bolt itself is a bit rounder up top. The extractor is new, now serving double duty as a loaded chamber indicator. Otherwise, there isn't anything new here from last time. So let's enjoy this clockwork wonder just a bit longer. And then go shoot it. Yeah, she looks rough, but she runs fine. The German Navy would contract for these babies in December of 1904. 8,000 pistols with stocks and accessories for what is believed to be 43 marks each, all produced by DWM. Each was issued with three magazines and was initially carried on a leather strap, though this later shifted to a belt loop. Delivery was made by the spring of 1906. Now this leads to some collector confusion. In many circles, the Trials pistols are known as the 1904. This comes from an early belief that 1,500 to 2,000 had been acquired in 1904 for that test. Looking at the budget numbers and what few documents can be found about the trial, the number is likely closer to 150, but because of that presumed high number, many thought that the Trials pistols were a first contract and declared uh, the actual 1904, this guy here, to be the second contract, and frequently referred to this 
as the Model 1906 because of the year of its first delivery. However, Pistol 1904 is the only real designation, with the former simply being a small number of trials guns. Following the first deliveries, another 8,000 pistols were contracted for. These appeared to have been the same price and were delivered on a much more leisurely schedule. Now, arming adoption of the PO8, like I mentioned earlier, would cause a bit of confusion. They chose to make their safety turn on in the down position and fire in the up position. This obviously led to some confusion, but likely not as much as when in June of 1912, the Navy opted to follow along, switching all of their pistols as I explained earlier. From this point on, new production would come from the factory with already swapped safety positions. And speaking of safeties, there was a curious paragraph in the Navy's 1906 manual on the Luger pistol. If the grip safety lever is rearranged in such a way that its pin rests in front of its spring instead of behind it, the automatic safety is disengaged. The spring now permits the grip safety to lie flat on the back strap so that its upper end always permits the movement of the sear bar. The pistol can now be rendered safe only by means of the thumb safety lever. So it seems there was already a faction with distaste, much like the Swiss, for that grip safety. All right, the pistols are in sailors' hands, and they've standardized with the army, at least enough to prevent any accidents. 16,000 should be enough for the fleet, right? Well, uh, the 1904 was actually fairly popular with fleet expansion and the addition of more specialty troops, there was starting to be a bit of a shortage. The problem was glaring by 1913, and so the Navy withdrew somewhere between 10 and 20 pistols from each uh, battleship or battle cruiser and limited issue accordingly on down the line. This freed up mm, roughly 1,300 pistols for other vessels and land-based forces to make use of. This might have bought some more time, if not for the fact that war were declared. As we know, the Great War would consume a lot of equipment. By August 10th, the Navy received news that all orders to DWM would have to be routed through the Prussian Ministry of War, so they immediately requested 2,000 additional pistols. They would also still reach out directly to DWM, requesting 8,500 more. There are not clear records on which contract or both were really ever honored. Uh, serial studies show that it's likely that roughly 8,000 did make it into Navy inventory in this period, though. That 1914 order would introduce a new version of the Navy pistol. Since the automatic safety was already controversial, they decided to save time and materials and drop it from production. Interestingly, a small improvement would also be made to the rear hinge pin at this point. The diameter of its flange was increased, likely to avoid tying up with worn parts or loose tolerances. Otherwise, this pistol is the same as the standard 1904, with its larger frame still being used. In February of 1916, the Army would order another modification to their gun, the sear bar of their P08 Lugers. This was a simple bit of extra machining that allowed the uh, original manual safety to still work as intended, but also for the action to be opened while on safe. The Navy would accept the same modification in March, likely for streamlining production. Already issued pistols were supposed to be updated after the war, but this doesn't appear to have remained a priority at all. In August of 1916, the Navy would order another 8,000 pistols. Nearly all of these are noted in receipts, so it seems the contract was completed. This time, the standard small frame was put to work, since all Army models were now equipped with stock logs, that means the P08, LP08, and Naval 1904 were all on the same pattern now, greatly simplifying production. However, the Navy still kept its long barrel and two position 200 meter rear sight. Guns in that pattern will be marked on the chamber area, 1916 or 1917, and that 1917 production represents another curious anomaly. Observations of serials put the 1917 production at 15,000 units, a massive gain. However, basically all of these don't seem to show in the naval receipts during the war. The disposition of maybe the 1970 pistols or maybe just a mix of the 16s and 17s is a bit of a mystery. There are some likely users, however, uh, most notably the two C battalion that were now stationed in uh, Belgium for the war. Now mostly land-based, they were responsible for the German flank and manned various coastal installations. Also, they were used to crew things like the Paris gun. 
There's also the Airsat Sea Battalion deployed at Flanders, which would have actually taken the 1904 into the battlefield proper. There may have even been some wider issue of the 1904 beyond the Navy Command. I've read, but sadly not been able to find, an image of the Guard Reserve Pioneer Regiment with men carrying 1904 holsters. Uh, those guys had the oh, flamethrowers. So you never know what might later be unearthed about these guys. Now, as for the normal service of a 1904, they generally were found exactly where you would expect, in the hands of boarding crew being used to guarantee compliance when searching vessels at sea. And sometimes they were likely present for a handful of conflicts like the Siege of Tsingtao, although these were a little bit more rare for the German Navy. Now, of course, at the war's end, Germany's navy was severely transformed and, of course, shrunk. They would standardize on the P08 sharing with the army and pulling from a much larger reserve of fresh parts. The 1904, therefore, was dropped from service. Done. 1918. All right. I'd normally roll into a bit of the inventor's personal history, but as you may recall, we already have an episode up on the next gun in the series, the P08, which I may also be convinced to update someday in the distant future. But for today, however, let's just go ahead and get this gun into May's hands for her opinion. Her opinion on the Naval 1904. Once more, we've made room for May. Hello! And yet another loser. We have all of the losers. Loser. Well, no, we don't have all the losers. We just have most of them here with us. I should have done the whole episode by saying loser. Do you know how much our engagement would go up from oh everybody being Oh my god, like, it's not pronounced loser. Yeah, I should have been like Georg loser. It sounds too much like loser is the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well. There's my loser. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the technically new model. I've got the old model. Yeah. Uh, we already went through in the episode. This is a new model Luger, except for the part where the frame is old model y. Mm -hmm. um, and we borrowed this from our buddy. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to say his name or no? GBF over GBF? on our Discord. Yeah, thank you. He changes his username all the time. Yeah, he's GBF to me. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, he first, knows. Yeah. What, was that like a primary username for it? Discord makes life weird. Actually, yeah. the internet makes life weird for yeah. this sort of stuff. Um, but without doxing our good friend, he mm -hmm. lent us this uh, Luger. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> tell me what's going on with this thing ergonomically compared to the old model that really stands out, though. You know, first impressions. Well, um, there's really only observationally two things just from looking at it. One, longer barrel. Okay, sure. Must be better. Must be better. Longer is better. Wait, don't listen to that statement. Um, or it can? I don't know. And then the sight. Ah, I've got two positions. I can go from 100 to 200. I can shoot this pistol out to 200 meters. Yeah. At least it's less ambitious. Like, I kind of like it because it's like, yeah, we'll, we'll make it go up to 200. And then when they did the artillery model, they're just like, no, we want like five. And you're like, it's like who's shooting out Nobody's to doing that. <laughs> just go up to 200 meter. And they're just really jazzed about it. Oh, can we? Oh, look, Jeff did. Jeff did an awesome job. He shot the target at 500 once. I mean, to be fair, they, they want it to be mass fire for the artillery model. And this one, I was never, I don't think there was any much intention to do it as a mass fire pistol. Yep. And then it looks like it has, oh, it has a little extra little knob here on the back. What could that possibly be for? Oh, yeah, it might be. stock, yes. That might be very specifically like why it has the reproduction. 200 meter. Yeah, but yeah. Brad, do I need to put it on? I'm just watch you try to orient this and remember which way the lever needs to be. Oh. I heard which way it went. Wow. I'm not completely dumb. Yeah. Just mostly. Um, but yeah, no, now I've got this handy stock attachment. This is a big rad. difference. Oh, yeah, huge difference visually. It's totally different from that guy. Yeah, but you're getting way too ahead. Let's just talk about the pistol for a minute. <sighs> it takes away the stock. And uh, so visually, that pretty much covers it. Operationally, though, slightly different in that with this newer one, I can just pull up on the toggle. I don't need to pull back a little bit then up like I did on the 1900. I right. can just pull straight up. It doesn't have that rebound check yeah. lever. And then obviously different now, caliber. The reason, again, that they ditched, the reason that that's like that is this used a softer two flat spring system, mm -hmm. which meant that it had a tendency to bounce and then stick out a battery. Yep. So they put a check lever on it so it would stay locked down. So you have to overcome yep. the lever. So and we're then, missing our check lever on this other, on this side right here. Right. Because that one has a coil spring mm -hmm. and it stays locked down. Bouncing was not an issue. Great. Fantastic. So, big so improvement. Sweet. Really simple and smooth. Otherwise, yeah, everything things, else is pretty if, much. If you were to load that guy up, we don't. I don't know where snap caps went, but uh, the extractor would pop up, mm -hmm. and you could thumb the extractor, or you could read the side of it, and it would tell you that it was loaded in yeah. the chamber. That chamber indicator. Nice. Yeah. Fantastic. So that's about it if you're a user of the mm -hmm. pistol. 
Um, you're really not going to be concerned about a lot of the minor differences. No. There is something that's different on this pistol. It started life with the safety in the same position as this one. Yeah. And now it has changed. So they would flip them later on, like I said in the episode. Hey, right. So does that make a difference for you? So now you're on, I believe, safe. Yeah, now I'm on safe with it down. Okay, so that means safety on is more difficult. The safety off is really fast when I'm pointed. Right. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's a big improvement. I like that. That's way better. Let's go with that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anything else that stands out? Uh, the trigger's still mushy. <laughs> the grip safety still has that long travel. It's the cartridge. I, well, it's already said. I said the cartridge. I know, but that's what's going to oh, stand okay, out. Yeah, fine. Yeah, because fine. realistically, the only difference between shooting this guy and this guy is the longer barrel, which means more sight radius and probably a little more, if it was the same cartridge, a little more velocity. Yeah, look, I can even have more sight radius if You're I not using that with it in that yeah, configuration. I could, I could have more. So let's just talk, like, we're going to have to skip because there's not ergonomically all that different. Let's no. skip right into shooting. Okay. So let's talk about shooting that naval Luger one-handedly. Without the stock? Not yet. <sighs> I could shoot it one-handed with the stock. Okay. Um, so one-handedly shooting this guy. Uh, yes, I've got the longer sight radius. I, you can obviously tell. And also, it looks like the sight's slightly different because of these extra little, not wings, but more like... Protectors. Yeah, yeah, protectors. Yeah, they're up here. So yeah, there's definitely they definitely feel taller, and I'm able to find that sight much faster, which is pretty good for me. So you like the sights better on the navel? Yeah, I do like the sights better on the navel. Okay. So. What about that muzzle? Is that giving you any balance issues? Um, it actually feels like... So it's not as neutral feeling as the 1900 was in terms of the weight balance on it, but... I will say, if I'm having to move any, like we talked about last episode, I think it's going to be a little bit better for balance. Just instinctually, do you prefer that or do you prefer the more neutral one? Technically prefer the more neutral one, personally, because I'm having to just do standing shooting. Like, I really am not moving any, so for me, that feels better naturally, whereas I think if I were moving, that might feel better. See, I like this way better. I really like it better with the muzzle. You can have it. I want that forward mass. See how it's doing that? Uh -huh. I like to have just a little bit. Not a lot. I don't want to be stupid heavy, but just a little bit is where it's at. And it's balanced out for you better, huh? Now, okay. this one is obviously not as in good a shape. No. Nope. Uh, notorious for Lugers is that the grip panels are starting to fail. Yep, and the, that is something you can feel a little bit of wiggle on these guys. They have very little in the way of support inside the wood panels, mm -hmm. and they tend to crack and fail, and they have to get glued back up, or they have to get replaced. Yep. Um, it really is sort of the worst thing in terms of wear for the Lugers that I know of. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, running like a top. Yeah, it did perfectly fine. Accuracy between this and the 1900, if I remember correctly, was pretty spot on. Like, they're pretty even. We're shooting at a very short range. Right. 30 feet. Yeah. So. And I can't remember. Did we do 50 yards? 70 yards? I want to say it was 50 for the yeah. for the actual attachment of the stock. Now, 9mm Parabellum versus the original 30. Mm -hmm. The 765 Parabellum. Yep. Any real difference in recoil? I mean... Maybe, but I can't really tell. Is no, I know she's going to do the comparison thing where she puts the overlaid the, video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep in mind, longer barrel, that one's going to have to come up higher it for the same. To. No, it probably the, did. No, no, no. I'm saying, like, if they both rotate five degrees, right. that will go higher. Yes. So don't read the top of the barrel, read the action. Yeah. Okay. So we'll see in the replay. Yeah. But to me, I didn't notice. I tend to think of the 30s being a little softer shooting, but that might be. I agree. And it looked like the holes were slightly smaller with the 32. But then again, the sense. heavier barrel would yeah. probably help. So we'll see. Yeah. But, um, that's pretty much it, though, in terms of this guy for actually shooting, yeah, though. All right. You can hear it in her voice. She's yeah. bored of it. No, I'm not bored of it. You're bored of it being a pistol. Attachment. To be fair, the stock attachment, which I'm doing it so well right now, but on camera, I, I flubbed it a have little bit. You, I wasn't smooth. Have you developed a taste for pistol caliber carbines? I do kind of like the idea of it. Yeah. They're funny. Yeah. They're stupid. I think... Did you get them? Yeah. There's a friggin' net, and I hate him. No. Oh. Well, I don't hate him, but he can't be here. Okay. Because he'll make more. Okay. And I don't want them. Okay. So. Not on his own. He needs a friend. Uh, I, I love stocked pistols. Oh, yeah. They're they're so not They're hilarious. They're useful. stupid. Yeah, they're they're practically, they aren't really useless, but they're not really useful either. <laughs> they sound like such a good idea. And then in execution, you're like, oh, they're attacking. 
Well, it's like what you talked about in the C96 episode. You found that historical photograph of that guy who was wearing yeah, that stock already attached, already ready, around his neck, just hanging there. You yeah. were like, oh, that's perfect. That's exactly how you should do that, just be ready at any moment. It's one of those things, it's like it's a little kit, and it's cute, but I don't know. But anyway, yeah. so you have it stocked. What's it yep. like shooting it stocked? Way more fun. It really is. Like, it, you can see the barrel barely goes up, and the mitigation of recoil is way better. And it just becomes like a fun little plinker. You don't really, you don't feel like you're shooting barely anything out of it, which is kind of fun. Although I will say, it again, these were one-handed design shooting guns. It really feels awkward to put my second hand on this gun, even with the stock attachment. Yeah, I still, I still like it. I, I definitely prefer the Luger stock to the C96 stock. Yes, um, it's although, cleaner. Although that, again, that's a reproduction one. Yeah, I mean, there's a little play and stuff, but no, it's it's the same stock. Yeah. Uh, my problem is, I prefer if I had to own one, I would prefer to have a Luger with stock yeah. over a C96 with stock. 100%. However, when I put the stock on and I go like this, C96 feels better. But Inherently as, so. As a but only a little bit better. Mm -hmm. As a handgun, this feels radically better than the C96. Yes. So as a package deal, I choose this over the C96. Right. But I will say points to the C96. This you're right. This is a little awkward compared to having that nice Ford. Yep. That right there where the Magwell is being able to hold on to that for C96 yep. does feel naturally better. And then the C96's native cartridge of 7.63 Mauser. Mm hmm. Screamer, like I would love that as a carbine cartridge. Also, and I guess like you, you don't really attach. You don't put the Luger inside this stock, whereas the C ninety six, the stock and the Luger. You no, but you'd have a there. leather holster attached to that if we okay, had the yeah. whole kit. So you, same effect. Okay. As a matter of fact, this is not as likely to break with the leather. That's true. I mean, a hundred years later, they're wearing out. But at yeah. the time, I'd rather have this with the leather than the wood C ninety six holster. Mm -hmm. The wood C ninety six holster is so easily broken, and we talked about how hard it is to carry. In a ready condition. Yeah, it is absolutely weird because of the hammer and yeah. then, yeah, you have to, yeah. I and these you. are striker fired, so you can carry it in whatever condition in the... Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. They're already ready to go. Rad. Okay. So what did you feel? Good feels. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, was it confidence inspiring? It was actually attaching, having the stock availability to stabilize it. Yes, is good, but not ne absolutely necessary. It already feels like pretty equivalent to the nineteen hundred, just. I think I like the sight slightly better on this guy. And I think if this gun had overall been in better condition, the performance would have been even better, which is kind of cool. To you know, think we, about. we didn't have um, the opportunity to do any long range testing with it because the range is still being rebuilt. Right. And this gun is worn. Mm -hmm. But if anybody would like to loan like a stock Luger that's in really good barrel shape, mm -hmm. we now have enough room that we could be doing some 200 meter testing. That would be kind of cool. It'd be kind of fun to see if mm -hmm. you can even hit. A man sized anything at that range with those oh, nine millimeters. Yeah. Cause I feel like that two hundred meters is still ambitious even as it is. I agree. I'd be I'd be interested to see how it handled if I stock on and stock off trying to ha like hammer it down range at two hundred meters, see what it did. Yeah. So I basically have two questions for you. Okay. Uh one is going to be let's start with the first one. Mm -hmm. Is this something you'd be comfortable with in the war? You know, I can't see the possibility of adding on a stock attachment as a bad thing, it's just an extra accessory. Yeah, just sort of so, there. So yeah, I don't see how this has gone down from the 1900. And like I said, for me, I like this light slightly better. So for me, it's gone up a little bit. So definitely a yes. Yes. Preference between this and the 1900. Well, I think I just explained that. I think he just realized the answer to second question. You I haven't will, gone through everything. Well, no, 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 you actually technically. More, you have a more reliable recoil spring. Yes. You have better sights like you said. True. You do have to carry around a longer barrel. Right. Get a good sight radius. And then my balance is not as preferred with this one as it is with the 1900. Okay. Technically. You're still using the grip safety. Mm -hmm. Sa but better cartridge. Oh, I was going to say safety position is better. Mm -hmm. And then let's talk about the cartridge. So yeah. 9mm Parabellum. Yep. Do you trust that more than 7.65? Yes, I do. 30 Luger. Yes, I, t I trust it more over 30 Luger. You do? Yeah. You do? Yeah. Okay. Do you not? I just know that... Uh, Georg Luger himself did not trust it that much. Why? <laughs> he didn't trust it mechanically. Um, he really didn't like losing obturation mm -hmm. to the point that, like, we, I think we talked about in our PO8 episode, although now i got to go back and double check. He ended up cutting an extra ring in the chamber to get some obturation for, because he didn't like straight walled cartridges. He liked bottleneck cartridges. Hmm. And so that's why um, 
the original 30 caliber Luger, the 7.65 Parabellum. That's why it was bottlenecked. And then because it was bottlenecked, it luckily gave him room to do a straight wall so that he could do 9mm Parabellum. And I think it's very interesting that 9mm Parabellum, which was really just like, oh god, we really don't want to change the tooling on all this, right? That cartridge got invented so that they could just keep on making the same frame and have a 9mm bore. And it was the biggest size they could make because it was the actual OD of the case, right? Mm -hmm. That became the de facto handgun cartridge for the world today. Well, it must have been doing something right. Yeah, and at the time, don't forget, 9mm Steyr, right? Mm -hmm. um, 9mm um, Largo, 9mm. There's other 9mm all over that could have become the big 9mm because they're just a little bit different. Right. But what made Luger so likely to win is that it was designed in order to fit in an ergonomic package, mm -hmm. which means that you could more easily design your handguns. However... Do you think that 9mm is going to be as good as this? If you have a single shot pistol, are you going to pick 9mm or 45 ACP? Well, if it's if it's single shot, I'm going to take 45 ACP because I want to be able to get the most out of it. So, yeah, I'd take the 45 and it's a single shot. Bullet. Okay, so the Luger is useless. So you heard May say it. She said there's, <sighs> there's, there's no reason to use a 9mm when she could carry a 45, uh -huh. right? Is that what you're saying? Uh huh. Because the single shot. You see person? what he's doing? Yeah. Yeah. It's being a jerk. No. We have a magazine. And we yeah. talked about this last time. Shot, magazine is way better. Multiple follow-up shots. Uh, time to be able to return to your target. Mm -hmm. Much better. Um, and if I mess up on one shot, I'm not one and done. I've got several. And I don't know about you. We, you kind of said, well, I know about you because you kind of said it. There's not that big of a performance difference between these two in terms no, of recoil really and follow-up shooting. So why not take the 9mm? Mm -hmm. The problem is once you move up off of 9mm and you start dealing with recoils that affect your shooting, mm -hmm. Uh, it's going to become, yeah. This is a very real thing that the U.S. would eventually face, too, because now that we're talking about 9mm Pell Bell, I do want to hint, we are going to be covering the development of the U.S.'s handgun. Yep. And they had to face this same thing of, like, well, hold on, what's more What's important? too far, yeah. Right. And they chose differently. <laughs> but in the long run, Parabellum is king. I mean, it is the most common handgun cartridge. But I do love that it was a compromised cartridge. Mm -hmm. Because it reminds me of a more modern story that I guess we'll have to talk about sometime, which was the development of 40 Smith & Wesson. Oh, yeah, you were talking again, about that the other day. Yeah, it was how do we keep the same frames and get more oomph out of it. Right. So that question's come up before. A lot of people think of Parabellum as the default, but it was an afterthought. And I think it's critical to understand that because that's how we learn as a species is, you know, trial and exper uh, trial and failure. Trial and error. Yeah, a lot of failures. But We have to learn from those. I don't know. I consider the Luger a winner. Yeah, now, pretty good um, winner. I was going to give you a second question. Okay. But I have completely forgotten it. Best job 100. No, I remember now. Okay. Uh, the second question, so that I don't get in trouble, okay. is out of all the Lugers we've seen. Because at this point, you've now handled the Swiss 1900, the old okay. model. You've handled what is essentially an old model frame with new model everything else mm -hmm. in the naval. We've handled the regular German P08. Okay. And we've, which has a stock look on later production, but it doesn't come with stock. So mm -hmm. that's an unstocked. This is unstocked. And then we have the quote unquote artillery Luger, the LP08. Right. So out of all those Lugers, mm -hmm. which one has been your favorite so far? Well, I do like them stocked for funsies, so I'm probably going to pick one of the stocked boys for that. But so then between that's this... going to give you the artillery or this one. Uh huh. I'm trying to scrape my memory now here. I think the artillery has a slightly longer barrel or mm -hmm. close to the same size. It's very similar in shape. I think so. However, it had a forward mounted. Um, oh, tangent yeah, leaf tangent sight. leaf sight. I remember that, that it bounced went, up and down. Yeah, and it went kind of crooked too. Whenever because for the, to affect the range. Yeah, I did not care for that. So those are your. That's really like your big difference. Yeah, I'll I'll stick with this guy. You heard it, naval luger, best luger. Yeah, one hundred. Actually, I agree. I, I, I really. <laughs> the problem Can you is imagine shooting that up to five hundred. They're so expensive and hard to get. And I still I love the German naval luger. It's it is the best Luger. I yeah. mean, I mean, there's other cool Lugers out there, but I love this. It's thing. It's pretty good Luger. Yeah. So we're really glad to borrow it because I can't yeah. afford one. Thanks, GBF. Yeah. <laughs> and we didn't destroy the market because it was already bad. It's not my fault. <laughs> yeah. Now you're just gonna do that with the Colts, right? All right. So you've named you named the Luger as acceptable, and you named this King of Lugers. Mm-hmm. Okay. Pretty good King. You're declaring King of Lugers. Yeah. Okay, he's, he's already got a little crown. If yeah. you have a Luger better right than here. this Luger, please Crown. tell us so that May can evaluate it. But yeah. right now she's declared king of Lugers. Yeah. Do you have a little 
thing to put on top of it? No, you didn't tell me we were going to be doing a bit, so we I didn't get, prepare like, a, a little crown. plastic crown to put on things when we, we declare like, king of... We had like little birdie king crowns you could just put on stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't think they have tiny ones. Yeah, that'd be kind of cute. All right. Well, uh, obviously we've run out of things to say because we're talking about Burger King. Yeah, let's get food. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> we're going to get out of here. Stay after the credits for any updates. May, do you have any final thoughts? Nope. I'm just happy to have gotten to experience it. Um, I wish I could continue to experience it, but we will have to send this back. I mean. Eventually. It's, I guess you could call the cops or something. Yeah. But anyway, bye. Bye, everybody. Update time, folks. For those of you who watched our first live show experiment on Utreon, the Johnson poster is ready and available at our shop. Otherwise, we're hard at work catching the production schedule back up, so not a lot to report. If you're curious about some of the minutiae, however, don't forget every patron has access to our internal podcast. Thanks for the support.